there is a massive problem on social media when it comes to dissociative identity disorder. There's enormous amount of harm being thrown out there. Harmful theories, harmful ideas are affecting young people terribly. And almost all, at least 95% of all of these videos are credulous of a harmful theory in dissociative identity disorder. So I'm going to try and debunk some of it here today. My name is Dr. Lawrence Patihius. I am a cognitive and social psychologist with interests in dissociative amnesia, dissociative identity disorder, um, memory, memory distortions, and all of that good stuff. I am a, a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth. Okay, I've published more than 60 articles in peer-reviewed journals on topics like this, um, especially dissociative amnesia, repressed memories, that kind of thing, and um, how memory works, memory distortions as well. Okay, that's out of the way. As I was saying, the amount of harm being done by the YouTube algorithm in dissociative identity disorder is probably enormous because these videos that are um, spreading myths about how uh, dissociative identity disorder works, um, um, including from clinicians who are credulous of the theory, including um, um, people who purport to have DID and uh, encouraging other people to believe that they have DID, whose self-diagnosis is going on quite a lot, um, people are doing switching videos, and that that seems very f um, <clears throat> convincing to the to the um, people watching. And the, the the damaging thing about all of this is, it's the misinforming switching videos and the incorrect clinical psychology videos that are getting the millions of views. For some reason, um, I think I think I understand why. I think. Um, when you see somebody switching from one personality to another, that's very interesting. That can get millions of views. When you hear about what seems to be a very unusual case of somebody having 30 personalities, that gets a lot of eyeballs on the video too. And there is maybe five out of the top 200 videos, if you search for dissociative identity disorder, that are fairly skeptical. I think there's one, for example, by Todd Grande, one um, uh, by somebody else um, that is kind of, that kind of lays out the theory as if it's true, you know, and they state what, that it's in the DSM, which is kind of harmful in a way, but then they talk about the um, skepticism later. It's very rare to see a fully skeptical video on DID, and there should be more, because I think the fully skeptical ones are actually the true ones, and there's maybe one out of 200 that are fully skeptical. Okay, let me give you a video that is fully skeptical on a dissociative identity disorder. Okay, let me give you the history really quickly. First of all, the history is not scientific. It's absolute nonsense. It came from Pierre Janet's idea. He was a hypnotist in 1880s, in 1887 or whatever it was. He um, thought that he had observed uh, somebody have a dual consciousness with one set of memories that w was um, connected to hypnosis and one set of memories that was not conscious of the other memory um, because of the hypnosis um, that he undertook. This likely never happened. It was likely the fact, and we, we haven't had any um, um, confirmation that hypnosis can do this, and of course it can't, and hypnosis has been uh, debunked since then, but that's what they believe. They believe that somebody really had split consciousness. Pierre Janet named that dissociation, and dissociation came to mean um, this split consciousness in Pierre Janet, it meant split into two in his case. 
Now, a few years later, Morton Prince was a psychologist at Harvard who learned from Pierre Janet, asked Pierre Janet to come and do um, uh, lectures over at Harvard. And Morton Prince then was the kind of um, first person to say you could split into more than two. So Pierre Janet was splitting into two consciousnesses. And Morton Prince um, wrote the first case study of a a uh, woman who he reported, not necessarily the woman, but he himself, the, the, the psychologist, reported had split personalities, uh, many uh, personalities. Now, if you read that book uh, or that paper by Norton Prince in 1905, 1906, uh, you will see that this is not science. It's a lot of it in, is coming from the suggestions from the therapist based on the therapist's own beliefs. And where did he get these beliefs? He got them from Pierre Janet. Where did Pierre Janet get his beliefs? Well, he thought somebody had dual consciousness in hypnosis. This is not science. This is case studies <coughs> and heavily uh, theorizing clinicians creating these cases. All right, fast forward. Not many cases of uh, multiple personality were per- uh, reported um, up until the 1950s where a um, pair of psychiatrists thought that they had deco- d- uncovered another multiple personality case. Again, this is probably caused by the beliefs of the therapists or influenced by, by the beliefs of the therapists. Maybe the patient really did have identity problems. I'm not sure. But in any case, the case that they studied called Eve was then turned into a film and it's the films and the books that really had an effect on uh, diagnosis. The Three Faces of Eve was a book published in the 1950s, was it was a film published in a um, film um, released in the 1950s and it had an effect on the beliefs of society, it had an effect on psychiatrists who saw it, had, it had an effect of on, on the public as well. Now, fast forward to 1973, and the book called Sybil was released, a book that has been thoroughly debunked later by uh, Debbie Nathan. De- Debbie Nathan, so if you want to look up her book on Sybil. And that was a, a, another extraordinary case of what they purported to be multiple personalities. I think it was a fake case. I don't think it really was. Um, I don't think the person really did have multiple personalities. Maybe they did have pre-existing problems. Okay. A few years later, a film was produced, made for television, um, but got millions of views um, by the public called Sybil. Because, so the movie Sybil um, also was reward award-winning, just like The Three Faces of Eve was also award-winning very popular, and that really affected American public. A lot of people were being affected by this, starting to think, maybe do I have multiple personalities? Oh, I can't remember what I did yesterday. I can't remember this. Ooh, you know, And they started putting together stories in their minds and seeking out therapists. Therapists started to ad- adapt. Some therapists believed that this was a real new disorder and diagnosis of Multiple personality disorder went way up. Multiple personalities went way up. So much so that in 1980, just a few years after the film Sybil, multiple personality disorder was first put into the DSM. That's a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So if you don't think that films affect um, the medical, the, the psychiatric field, think again. Just a few years after this um, uptick in diagnoses, this, um, which was caused probably by the books and the films, um, there you have it. All right, so this is not science, right? So think about you know the way Pierre Janet came up with the idea of splitting, then Morton Prince. This is a metaphorical um, kind of belief system, you know. I mean. How do you measure splitting? Um, are they really splitting? It's basically a metaphor. This is 
In any case, this is not in the realm of measurable science. In the 1980s, they thought, okay, well, how do we measure this? Nobody's measured this um, numerically before, so maybe we could get a sci make a science out of this. And a scale was developed by people who really wanted to prove that this was a real thing, that was a real science. So they created a scale extraordinarily badly, extraordinarily subjectively to um, measure dissociation, and which is one of the symptoms of dissociative identity disorder. And that this scale called the Dissociative Experiences Scale, published by um, Carlson and Putnam, 1986, and then modified in 1993, um, was um, put together um, by um, uh, Frank Putnam, who went on to write about this, um, about multiple personalities later. Okay, let me give you just one item, because I'm, I'm just trying to help you, you know, so I might be capturing some audience, maybe 10 people, who have fallen down into dissoci dissociative identity disorder um, rabbit hole on YouTube. I'm just trying to help you as quickly as I can show you that this is not science. All right, let me give you one measure on the dissociative experiences scale. And let me explain why it's not science. Some people have the experience of driving or riding in a car or bus or subway and suddenly realizing that they don't remember what has happened during all or part of the trip. Place a check to show what percentage of the time this happens to you, and then you, you check between 0% and 100%. This is dreadful. I mean, do you understand how this is dreadful without me telling you? I'll tell you. As a cognitive psychologist who specializes in memory, every single human being forgets part of a trip. Even if it happened 30 minutes ago, we don't record memories. Anything we don't pay attention to is lost forever immediately. That's the short-term sensory memory stages, right? Anything that we do pay attention to may not be consolidated into long-term memory. This is just normal memory, so there's a massive loss of information, especially when we're thinking about something while we're driving, right? Or while we're on the train. And then long-term memory, some is some traces of memory are imprinted into long-term memory, and then that fades over time, all right? So it's totally normal and not pathological to not remember part of a trip, all right? So it's the same on all of these items in the dissociative experiences scale. So this is not science, however, this scale has been used hundreds of times since then in hundreds of peer review papers to try and prove that dissociation is a real thing, that dissociative identity disorder is a real thing, and that dissociative um, amnesia is a real thing. And in this kind of area of trying to prove this, um, has developed something called trauma and dissociation theory. That's what that's what I call it anyway. Okay. So even though they have a scale that measures something quantitatively, this is still not good science because the measure is so poor. Not only is the measure poor, but also the correlations between trauma and dissociation are very low as well. This is a dreadful state of affairs because even some skeptics who are on my side of the debate do not question whether this this dissociation measure is a good measure at all they or they don't question whether dissociation is a real scientific con concept enough well i'm questioning it right here and this is not science all right there was a massive backlash against the thousands of multiple personality um cases that arose in the 1980s by skeptics. In the early 1990s, cognitive psychologists like me, not, not me at that time, but, but cognitive psychologists would speak up and say, this does not make sense. This is a pseudoscience. This, these uh, uh, look like false memory cases in, in MPD. Uh, in the multiple personality cases seem to be a mixture of 
confob confabulating uh, multiple personalities f through role playing and through the um, therapist awarding rewarding that and drawing that out of people, the role playing out of people, and the dreadful problem of convincing those patients that their multiple personalities are caused by repressed trauma. That's probably the most damaging thing. So in the memory wars in the early 1990s, people started to say, I think these tremendously um, unrealistic memories that they're recalling in NPD therapy are false. So that was the memory wars. And as a result of the tremendous criticism of multiple personality cases it, by scientists, they changed the name in the DSM in 1994 from multiple personality disorder to dissociative identity disorder. The idea being, and this is something that David Spiegel has said, who's a psychiatrist at Stanford, the idea of that change of um, name is that it it's not literally true that people have multiple personalities in their head, so they changed the name to dissociative identity disorder. However, that name change did not help stop the tremendous harm being done in this area. Um, the problem continued unabated. Fast forward now to, uh, you know, putting lighter fuel on this flame and you have social media in the late 2010s and, and 2020s where there was an explosion, as I've said earlier, of multiple personality videos on YouTube getting millions of views, some of them getting you know, 5 million views for a single video, but, but maybe, maybe billions of views when you add up all the, um, all the numbers of hits on those videos. Now, the thing about these videos recently is, you know, most of them are credulous. But also, if you look in the comments, all the comments are also reinforcing of this kind of false theory, this bad uh, belief system that is quite harmful to individuals. You know, so you have comments saying, you are so brave to reveal your trauma. You know, you it, it's so amazing that you have these split personalities. Wow, I can see you change it at, at 543 to your other multiple personality and you get rewarded for this. And of course, the reward is also monetary. If you get millions of views, you get thousands of dollars per month. All right. Okay. Now, let's get down to it as quickly as I can. Is it real? So I'm talking to you who have watched hundreds of hours of dissociative identity disorder. You may be starting to self-diagnose, and I'm telling you, no, it is not a good disease category. Now, what do you do if it, you are involved in this kind of um, social contagion? Do you need a better therapist or do you just need to get out of this nonsense and get out of the um, the pit of uh, social media um, misinformation bubble? Well, it depends on what state of um, um, psychological health you were in before you got sucked into this belief system. So if you had good psychological health, um, before you started reading DID books or videos or watching videos, then you may not need a therapist um, once you get out of that belief system. However, if you had pre-existing um, uh, mental uh, uh, troubles before you got into this, then you might need to just switch over from a very, uh, from pseudoscientific, pseudoscientific therapist to more scientific therapists who are using um, um, theories that are going to be more helpful to you, such as uh, cognitive behavioral therapy may help, uh, behavioral psych um, uh, psychotherapists might help, um, or just in general, a, a clinical psychologist has been trained in research and, and knows the real research in, in, in psychology and is good, good at critical thinking, basically a skeptic. Um, um, somebody who's good at critical thinking, I should say. 
All right. So if it is not a good disease category, what are the reported cases, you know, in the literature? What are the reported cases on YouTube? Most of them must have been caused by the social contagion because there were so few of these cases before the movies, before um, the books, and before, um, before all of this. So most of them are iatrogenic, caused by social role-playing for the therapist, for, caused by the rewards put forward by the therapist, and so on. And also caused by the natural ability of humans to switch character and to play roles, to, 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 to talk in different voices. Most of us have this ability. And also, the, the, we're very limited in our cognition so that we don't notice or don't remember when we switch from one character to another. So we have this, these capabilities, and it's not at all difficult to play um, stereotypical characters and to do stereotypical voices as well. Okay, like a protector voice, I could do one right now, I don't want to embarrass myself. Or a child's voice, I could do one right now, I don't want to embarrass myself. But I could do those, act them out, and I would not notice the switch from one to another. Okay. I think another cause is poor critical thinking or poor metacognition within the person, you know, so you, the, the critical thinking, you know, an example of a poor critical thinking is to think, oh, yesterday, I couldn't remember what I did from eight till nine. Maybe I was in another personality at that time, and maybe now I'm in a different personality than the one I was in that time. This is poor critical thinking, but it's also shows a lack of knowledge of how memory really works. Everybody doesn't remember what they did yesterday between eight and nine. Don't worry about it. It's not p pathological. So it's what I hate about all of this is it's pathologizing just normal cognition. It's just normal not to remember what you did from seven to eight last night because you didn't consolidate it much because you were thinking about other things or, or whatever. It's just normal. So most cases are iatrogenic, and I would hope that they would clear up once you take away the belief system, repeat it, re replace it with um, good skepticism, good knowledge about how psychology works, good knowledge about how memory works, all of this, and um, um, maybe, maybe, maybe some... Um, very skilled psychologists would be needed in a, in, in a few of the cases. Okay. Now, some cases, though, may not be iatrogenic. They, they may not have been caused um, by the therapist. They may have been pre-existing, right? So there may be one or two very rare cases that there's genuine neural damage in areas involved in the perception of identity. Maybe it's congenital, um, maybe some brain damage happened from an accident, something like that. Okay, so those would need treatment. Um, but but by a brain expert rather than a DID expert, by a, 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 a critical thinking clinical psychologist who's not poor at thinking would help in those cases. All right. Another possibility is that some of these individuals might have a developmental lack in identity formation. So something happened during the deve de developmental stage of um, adolescence where identity didn't form um, as well as it did in others. And then they could, you know, maybe get help um, from sensible clinical psychologists. I mean, the rule of thumb is avoid the therapists that specialize in dissociative identity disorder they're not good thinkers and aim for those therapists who um, uh, maybe have done some research, maybe have formed good critical thinking skills from research. They, they should know the cl clinical psychology solid research, the experimental research and all of that. Um, um, go with somebody like that. Okay, somebody who's got a good track record and whose patients have not been getting worse 
and not being repetitively um, decomp decompensating. Okay, let's move on. What can you do if you have been dragged down into one of these hellish um, 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 internet bubbles of dissociative identity disorder, which are quite entertaining on the surface, but they're very damaging underneath. The reason they're damaging underneath is, although you get sucked into it and you watch hours and hours and hours on it, underneath it is the idea that all of this is caused by horrific trauma, usually perpetrated by your parents. Now, your parents are probably the one the two people in the world who uh, uh, who love you the most and if you are to, going to be dragged down into this you may lose you may choose to lose contact with them okay so it's hellish not only is becoming estranged hellish it's also very traumatizing to come to believe that you were traumatized even if you were not and it's very traumatizing to maybe traumatizing is the wrong word, it's very damaging to create false memories of trauma as well because it has a similar effect on people than real trauma does as well. So avoid false memories like the plague. Be aware, just being aware that false memories are possible will probably save you a lot of pain if you if you have been dragged down into dissociative identity, um, um, uh, social media bubbles. Okay, what else can you do? Get out of the YouTube algorithm. Get out of the Facebook al algorithm um, and 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 um, and Instagram because in YouTube at least and the other ones probably, when you watch a whole hour of a dissociative identity disorder video, it will know that that's what gets you engaged, and because the algorithm knows what makes you engaged, it will present you with lots more videos like that and there's hundreds of them to go through so you could possibly watch uh, hundreds of hours of this material that is technically false so get out of youtube algorithm by ty typing in you know cat videos you know for a whole day just to get you just to get the algorithm stop recommending um, the uh, dissociative identity disorder algorithm and also read skeptic skepticism and seek out skepticism because it's not very popular all right so you're going to actually look for skepticism and you're going to find a skeptical video with 10,000 views instead of 10 million views or you're going to find a skeptical video you know 99 99 um you have to scroll down to find it and actually there's not many um skeptical videos and maybe some of them is shadow banned because the true believers report them um, as uh, being uh, as, as denying the reality of people with trauma, something like that. All right. Second, learn about other social contagions in history to find out how these work. You know, so learn about the Salem witch trials. You know, learn about exorcism. Um, which came before mesmerism. Learn about mesmerism and how mesmerism led to hysteria and hypnosis and then to multiple personality disorders coming out of the hypnosis um, um, a theory in, in, in uh, 1905. What else you can do? Well, you can learn about science of psychology, learn about falsifiability of invisible constructs. Be you know, think about it dissociation is kind of an invisible construct if it's not measured very well maybe it doesn't exist alters is an invisible construct maybe they don't exist we're in the realm here of invisible entities you cannot measure properly and therefore we're in the realm of ghosts rather than science we're in the realm of um, um, teapots going around jupiter things we cannot really measure very well okay i've said this before another thing you can do is choose your clinical psychologist more wisely many are good skeptics many are good critical thinkers choose the critical thinkers the down-to-earth ones are good with good reputations the ones that do not produce 
um, false memory cases, those that do not produce a string of dissociative identity disorder cases. This is the opposite, by the way, of what some young people do when they start to believe they have dissociative identity disorder. What they do tragically is go from therapist to therapist to therapist until they find one that, that affirms that they have multiple personalities or dissociative identity disorder. And then they get a diagnosis from that one person, that one therapist is willing to diagnose that, and then they stop and stay with that person. This is the opposite of what you should do. Another thing you can do is read good clinical psychological science and related cognitive psychology of memory, you know, so um, read about how memory works in terms of attention, short-term memory, long-term memory, and then you, you come to learn that everybody is not going to remember something from yesterday. It doesn't mean you were split into a different personality. Learn about social co um, psychology. Learn about, you know, the uh, Stanford Prison Experiment and how they play roles. Learn about social cognitive theory of multiple personality, which which is all about how the, the client plays a role for the therapist. Learn about social influence. Well, lots of experiments in that way, too. Okay. And I'm going to place these references down in the uh, description, but there's some, just read these papers as well. So there's Spanos, Nicholas Spanos's article 1994 on the socio-cognitive perspective of uh, multiple personality disorder. Um, Lilienfeld and colleagues, 1999, wrote about it and expanded it. Excellent. Piper and Mirsky in, in 2004, Wrote, wrote this paper, and now listen to this title, The Persistence of Folly, Critical Examination of Dissociative Identity Disorder. Right, so this is out there. This is what really good scientists have written about this. And it's protective of the public to, to put this out there. And finally, in the description, you'll find a link to Gabri, Garabi, Garabi, uh, 2009, I can't pronounce that, and that's called Dissociative Identity Disorder, Time to Remove It from the DSM-5. And I wish it was removed from the DSM-5, because as long as we rearrange the deck chairs in the DSM-5 at this, at this disastrous set of um, ideas, the more it harms and continues to harm people because this is not a scientific good category. There's lots of pseudoscience in the typical theory around it that's believed by some therapists, very, very few therapists, by the way. But these few therapists create all of the cases, in some cases, most of the cases. So there you have it. Now, I'm just going to finish on this note. I'm putting this video out there because I think we should care more about the public than we care about other psychologists. I think we should put the public first rather than put, you know, put the relationships that we have with other psychologists whom we might disagree with first, you know. So if you take an approach of, you know, just letting other therapists make money, you know, we, you know, and, and, um, um, they can do this and we'll let them freely um, do uh, dissociative identity disorder um, therapy, you know, probably ruining people's lives. And we just let it go. Don't worry about it. Concentrate on our career. Concentrate on earning good money as, a, as an academic. Then we're, we're putting money, we're putting our relationships with those therapists and those psychologists first rather than putting the public first. And if I could kind of guess as to why we have done so such a poor job of removing DID from therapy and from the DSM, it's this. I think we have been put in other psychologists first, 
letting them earn good money. We'll earn good money. We'll argue in the peer review literature. We can get more articles if we argue with them in the peer review li literature. We'll be polite about it because we want to, you know, um, be collegial and all of this. We're putting other psychologists first. We're putting maybe students second where we um, allow students to freely decide whether they want to be a dissociative identity disorder therapist. We want them to make money. We want them to be successful. And we're putting the public last with this god-awful theory that harms so many people's lives. So what I suggest is we start debunking this and we start putting the public and young people first. 